Hey, what's up guys? Joker here. Today we are going to be taking a look at the Ryzen 7 2700X in gaming benchmarks up against my Intel i7 7700K. We're going to be testing both of these CPUs at stock speeds as well as at their max stable overclock that I was able to get. So we will definitely touch on the overclock of the Ryzen 2700X, how far it could be pushed. We'll talk about memory speeds, whether or not those were stable and what I could get them up to. And of course, also temperatures at the end of the day and what the temps are on the 2700X. Now, I was initially planning to do some comparisons with the previous generation of Ryzen processors, but I had a lot of issues with my testing on those. Um, it was just, there was, the CPUs were just crashing, the systems wouldn't boot, I was having possible motherboard issues, so I really wasn't able to narrow down what the problem was, but it definitely wasn't with the new Ryzen parts. It seemed to really just be all with all of my old Ryzen CPUs, and it just caused me so much headaches over the past couple of days, and I had to get something out for today. So that's why we're focusing on the 2700X versus the 7700K here for this testing. Now, let's first start off talking about the different variants of Ryzen that are available right now. The reviewers, as far as I know, we were all sent the same ones, the Ryzen 5 2600X, which I will be testing in a future video, and also Ryzen 7 2700X. So those are both of the X variants. They cost about $30 more than the non-X variants, and really the only difference between the X and non-X ones is slightly different coolers on the different versions, and also the out-of-the-box clock speed. Now, the cooler may or may not bother, may not matter to you if you're going to go out and pick up an aftermarket solution anyway, so really what you're left with is a higher out-of-the-box clock speed, but if you're an overclocker, that's probably not going to matter as much. So if you are in the market for one of these CPUs, which I'll leave links down to all of them in the description below over to Amazon, which helps to support my channel if you pick any of them up you can save yourself some money by getting the non-x variants so save yourself thirty dollars and you could probably easily overclock those to what the x variants are and possibly even beyond that because my ryzen 2700x and all well all 2700x's on the box it's, it is advertised at a max boost speed of 4.3 gigahertz and that's the first thing i want to talk about right now is i'm going to call bullshit on that because this thing could not run at 4.3 gigahertz on all cores, no matter what I did, no matter what voltage I threw at this thing, the highest voltage I tried was 1.42 volts, and that still could not run at 4.3 gigahertz across all cores. The best stable OC that I could get was 4.25 gigahertz. Even 4.26 would lose stability after a couple of benchmark runs, but 4.25 was fine. I was able to do that at 1.37 volts, which is really not too bad. And since I was running on an air cooler with the new Be Quiet Dark Rock 4, temperatures were pretty decent. So running at stock at idle, I was around 32 to 35 degrees Celsius. Under full load, I saw it at around 68 to 70 while when I was running overclocked at idle, it was 35 degrees Celsius and under full load maxed out with Ida 64 after 30 minutes, it settled between 75 and 78 degrees Celsius. So uh, overclocking headroom, really not a ton there. Like I said, only sitting at 4.25 gigahertz. Um, when you pull it right out of the box, it runs at around 4.15 across all cores, but when you start throwing um, some heavy loads on it across all cores with something like Ida 64, it would come down to around 4.05 and it would fluctuate between that and 4.150 um, in the different games that I was testing, as you'll see here in some of the side-by-side -side comparisons with stock versus overclocked and all of that. So yeah, that's really um, kind of the headroom you're looking at there. Not a whole lot. As I said, it's running at around 4.1-ish out of the box under load in games and things like that, but Overclocking, I was only able to get it to 4.25. Now, of course, your mileage could possibly vary on that, um, you know, depending on with the silicon lottery and everything, but I've already watched a couple other reviewers' videos go up, and I haven't heard anyone talking about any insane numbers so far on their 2700Xs, so I really wouldn't expect you to be able to push these very far. It really seems like AMD has already done the work for us and pushed these things as hard as possible, which is, you know, kind of where they're probably seeing a lot of their gains because these are pretty much refreshes of the last generation of Ryzen, just bringing it down to their 12 nanometer as opposed to 14 nanometer on the first generation of Ryzen CPUs. And of course they are running faster. I mean, the last generation, you were lucky to get it at up to four gigahertz. Most of mine 
sat stable at 3.9, but four gigahertz was kind of the ceiling you were seeing there on a lot of the CPUs. And this time around, it looks like we're around the 4.2 to 4.3 range. So they're just not incredible overclockers. Unlike the 7700K, which I compared it against, um, when that comes out of the box, it sits at 4.5 gigahertz, which is its boost speed. And it does that across all cores, no issues whatsoever. I was able to overclock that up to 4.9. Um, yeah, so that's the comparison we're gonna be making here today with these two different processors. As far as the test system is concerned, Be Quiet was gracious enough to sponsor out quite a few parts for the build so that I can get it done in time for launch day of the new Ryzen processors. So they sent me over their Dark Base 700 mid tower chassis, which is an absolutely fantastic case, which I've built in before. We also got one of their Straight Power 11 fully modular gold rated PSUs. It's an 850 watt. And I was also using their new Dark Rock 4 CPU cooler to help keep our 2700X nice and cool. The motherboard was the Gigabyte Aorus Gaming 7, which I'm actually using a Gigabyte Aorus board as well in the Intel system that I was using for the comparison. The RAM that I was using was sent out with the reviewer's kit. This was G-Skill Sniper X RAM at 3400 megahertz, which had hit absolutely stable, no issues whatsoever on the new processors. All that I had to do was enable the XMP profile and it was good to go from there. And that was at CAS latency 16. And I used that same RAM in the Intel system as well. So we were running at the same speed there as far as memory is concerned, 3400 megahertz, no matter which system we were using here for this comparison. And for the graphics, I was using my GTX 1080. I didn't have any additional overclocking on that card. I just had the power limit increased to as far as it would go in MSI Afterburner. And I was using the latest driver from NVIDIA for that, which was 391.35. But with that out of the way, let's get into our game performance numbers here and take a look at some side-by-side -side comparisons between the 2700X and the 7700K. All of the comparisons you'll be seeing on your screen right now and for the benchmarks were done at 1080p on high settings and the side-by-sides are with both of the processors at their maximum stable overclock. But in the graphs, you will be seeing stock speeds as well. And you can see that the 2700X is certainly getting quite close to the 7700K, really depending on the game that we're looking at here. And I would say that they've certainly seen some improvements compared to last year when I was comparing the 7700K against the likes of the Ryzen 1700 overclocked, but still Intel is leading against the newer Ryzen processors. Those are just the facts because they are just still much faster as far as getting higher clock speeds and all of that is concerned. I mean, I would love to see a 2700X at 4.9 gigahertz and put it up against the 7700K because I think we'd be talking about a very different story here. I think they'd be pretty much neck and neck, which, you know, it really kind of looks like clock for clock. These could be almost identical, but when, you know, you have these separated by such a difference in terms of frequency, uh, the 7700K is pulling ahead because in most of the games you're gonna play nowadays, uh, clock speed is still going to reign king over having the additional cores. And with the 6700, or should say the 8700K, already out there from Intel with six cores and discussions of a possible eight core mainstream variant coming by the end of 2018, that's what the rumors are saying right now is that Intel is looking to come out with an eight core 16 threaded part for the mainstream and not the high-end desktop space. That is certainly going to be something interesting to take a look at later in the year. But for what we have right now, the 2700X is still a very good CPU. And for people that want to pick one of these up to really take advantage of the multiple cores, if you're wanting to do stuff like video editing, I could speak from experience, having those additional cores is going to be a godsend. Just being able to have more threads to throw at everything. I've used Threadripper for, for rendering out most of the videos over the last 60 days here on the channel. And it's just an absolute monster. Um, and it really just should tell you that more cores, more threads is going to help with those type of workloads. Obviously, if you're doing things in like Blender as well, Photoshop, anything like that, if you're doing media encoding for stuff like Twitch streaming, definitely having the more cores and the more threads is going to help out quite a bit. Steve over at Gamers Nexus actually did some really in-depth stuff today with his 2700X. I would strongly suggest you go and check out their video as he showed some stuff with streaming side-by-side -side comparisons and everything um, to the 8700K, which is just, fantastic testing honestly if you're interested in that stuff i can't recommend 
checking out their review enough. But that's really all we've got for right now on the Ryzen 2700X. As I said, I will be doing some further testing here in the coming days with things like the 2600X. I also want to take a look at the CPU coolers and kind of test those and their thermal efficiency and everything to kind of discuss whether or not it's worth it going out and picking up a dedicated aftermarket cooler on top of something like the Wraith Prism, which is a very impressive looking cooler. That comes with the 2700X. The 2700 comes with the Wraith Spire with an LED. The 2600X comes with a Wraith Spire with no LED. And then the 2600, the bottom end SKU for $199 comes with the Wraith Stealth. So you've got quite a few different options here to choose from, but really at, at the end of the day, and I do want to look at this as well, the 2700X versus the 2600X to see if the extra cores are really worth it just for gaming. So that could be an interesting comparison to make too. And definitely be sure that you are subscribed for that content but I think right now just based on you know this video I think the 2700x is probably going to is, is going to show its benefits most to people that want to take advantage of the multi-threaded workloads or if you want to just pick one up to get into the into the AMD side of things and also it's going to save you some money to be able to get something that's already got a decent cooler out of the box with the Wraith Prism as I said we'll take a look at the numbers on that in a future video but yeah, with Intel, you're going to have to definitely buy an aftermarket cooler because theirs comes with a tinfoil piece of shit and the Ryzen stuff comes with a pretty kick-ass looking stock cooler for the Wraith Prism and the FPS numbers here aren't that different here and that's at 1080p on high settings. Obviously, if you were to step up to like 1440p and 4K, the gap between these numbers would become even closer because then you're talking even less about clock speed and just pure GPU throughput. So these numbers would get even closer if you're not playing at 1080p on high settings, which if you're picking up a high-end CPU like this or the 7700K or the 8700K, chances are you're going to pick up something like a GTX 1080, 1070, Vega 56, something along those lines, if you can actually afford one of the graphics cards right now. Um, so yeah, you might be interested in higher resolutions, which is definitely going to narrow the gap between the performance numbers on the different processors. If you want links to any of the new Ryzen parts or the parts that I'm using here in this system here with the parts that were sent out by Be Quiet, be sure to check out all of those links down in the description below as always. And I will catch you guys tomorrow for another video, very likely on Ryzen, as I have quite a few more videos in the queue here to come up on these different CPUs from AMD. If you enjoyed this video or learned something new, don't forget to leave a like on it down below and subscribe if you're not already. And I'll see you then for that next video. Turn.